business of natural law much less impressive than it formerly was. Quite apart from that, which represents the momentary state of science that may change tomorrow, the whole idea that natural laws imply a lawgiver is due to a confusion between natural and human laws. Human laws are behests commanding you to behave a certain way, in which way you may choose to behave or you may choose not to behave. But natural laws are a description of how things do in fact behave. And being a mere description of what they in fact do, you cannot argue that there must be somebody who told them to do that. Because even supposing that there were, you are then faced with the question, why did God issue just those natural laws and no others? And if you say that he did it simply from his own good pleasure and without any reason, you then find that there is something which is not subject to law. And so your train of natural law is interrupted. If you say, as more orthodox theologians do, that in all the laws which God issues, he had a reason for giving those laws rather than others, the reason, of course, being to create the best universe, although you would never think it to look at it, if there were a reason for the laws which God gave, then God himself was subject to law. And therefore, you do not get any advantage by introducing God as an intermediary. You have really a law outside and anterior to the divine edicts. And God does not serve your purpose because he is not the ultimate lawgiver. In short, this whole argument about natural law no longer has anything like the strength that it used to have. I am travelling on in time in my review of the arguments. The arguments that are used for the existence of God change their character as time goes on. They were, at first, hard intellectual arguments embodying certain quite definite fallacies. As we come to modern times, they become less respectable intellectually and more and more affected by a kind of moralising vagueness. The Argument from Design the next step in this process brings us to the argument from design. You all know the argument from design. Everything in the world is made just so that we can manage to live in the world. And if the world was ever so little different, we could not manage to live in it. That is the argument from design. It sometimes takes a rather curious form. For instance, it is argued that rabbits have white tails in order to be easy to shoot. I do not know how rabbits would view that application. It is an easy argument to parody. You all know Voltaire's remark that obviously the nose was designed to be such as to fit spectacles. That sort of parody has turned out to be not nearly so wide of the mark as it might have seemed in the 18th century, because since the time of Darwin we understand much better why living creatures are adapted to their environment. It is not that their environment was made to be suitable to them, but that they grew to be suitable to it, and that is the basis of adaptation. There is no evidence of design about it. When you come to look into this argument from design, it is a most astonishing thing that people can believe that this world, with all the things that are in it, with all its defects, should be the best that omnipotence and omniscience have been able to produce in millions of years. I really cannot believe it. Do you think that... If you were granted omnipotence and omniscience and millions of years in which to perfect your world, you could produce nothing better than the Ku Klux Klan or the fascists. Moreover, if you accept the ordinary laws of science, you have to suppose that human life and life in general on this planet will die out in due course. It is a stage in the decay of the solar system. At a certain stage of decay, you get the sort of conditions of temperature and so forth which are suitable to protoplasm and there is life for a short time in the life of the whole solar system. You see in the moon the sort of thing to which the earth is tending, something dead, cold and lifeless. I am told that that sort of view is depressing, and people will sometimes tell you that if they believed that, they would not be able to go on living. Do not believe it. It is all nonsense. Nobody really worries much about what is going to happen millions of years hence. Even if they think they are worrying much about that, they are really deceiving themselves. They are worried about something much more mundane, or it may merely be a bad digestion. But nobody is really seriously rendered unhappy by the thought of something that is going to happen to this world millions and millions of years hence. Therefore, 
although it is, of course, a gloomy view to suppose that life will die out. At least I suppose we may say so, although sometimes when I contemplate the things that people do with their lives, I think it is almost a consolation. It is not such as to render life miserable. It merely makes you turn your attention to other things. The Moral Arguments for Deity Now we reach one stage further in what I shall call the intellectual descent that the theists have made in their argumentations, and we come to what are called the moral arguments for the existence of God. You all know, of course, that there used to be in the old days three intellectual arguments for the existence of God, all of which were disposed of by Immanuel Kant in the Critique of Pure Reason. But no sooner had he disposed of those arguments than he invented a new one, a moral argument, and that quite convinced him. He was like many people. In intellectual matters he was sceptical, but in moral matters he believed implicitly in the maxims that he had imbibed at his mother's knee. That illustrates what the psychoanalysts so much emphasize, the immensely stronger hold upon us that our very early associations have than those of later times. Kant, as I say, invented a new moral argument for the existence of God, and that, in varying forms, was extremely popular during the 19th century. It has all sorts of forms. One form is to say that there would be no right or wrong unless God existed. I am not for the moment concerned with whether there is a difference between right and wrong or whether there is not. That is another question. The point I am concerned with is that if you are quite sure there is a difference between right and wrong, you are then in this situation. Is that difference due to God's fiat, or is it not? If it is due to God's fiat, then for God himself there is no difference between right and wrong, and it is no longer a significant statement to say that God is good. If you are going to say, as theologians do, that God is good, you must then say that right and wrong have some meaning which is independent of God's fiat, because God's fiats are good and not bad, independently of the mere fact that he made them. If you are going to say that, you will then have to say that it is not only through God that right and wrong came into being, but that they are, in their essence, logically anterior to God. You could, of course, if you liked, say that there was a superior deity who gave orders to the God who made this world, or could take up the line that some of the Gnostics took up, a line which I often thought was a very plausible one, that, as a matter of fact, this world that we know was made by the devil at a moment when God was not looking. There's a good deal to be said for that, and I'm not concerned to refute it. The argument for the remedying of injustice. Then there is another very curious form of moral argument, which is this. They say that the existence of God is required in order to bring justice into the world. In the part of this universe that we know, there is great injustice, and often the good suffer, and often the wicked prosper, and one hardly knows which of those is the more annoying. But if you are going to have justice in the universe as a whole, you have to suppose a future life to redress the balance of life here on earth. So they say that there must be a God, and there must be heaven and hell, in order that in the long run there may be justice. That is a very curious argument. If you looked at the matter from a scientific point of view, you would say, After all, I know only this world. I do not know about the rest of the universe, but so far as one can argue at all on probabilities, one would say that probably this world is a fair sample, and if there is injustice here, the odds are that there is injustice elsewhere also. Supposing you got a crate of oranges that you opened and you found all the top layer of oranges bad, you would not argue the underneath ones must be good, so as to redress the balance. You would say, probably the whole lot is a bad consignment. And that is really what a scientific person would argue about the universe. He would say, here we find in this world a great deal of injustice, and so far as that goes, there is a reason for supposing that justice does not rule in the world. And therefore, so far as it goes, it affords a moral argument against deity and not in favour of one. Of course, I know that the sort of intellectual arguments that I have been talking to you about